now will be in there. Oh, we're in now, so that's good. Oh, no, we're not. Uh, hang on a second. So any second now, I'm just going to keep checking in uh, on here. And that's it. Oh, we're done. Good. Awesome. Okay, I think we're here. Yes, we are. Good. Just going to get rid of that. Got it. Brilliant. Hi. Hi. Hi how are you? Hello, I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Good um, to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. And we had, oh my God, we had such a great chat off air before. And uh, we're going to struggle to kind of keep this to within the hour, but we've got a lot we're going to discuss today, but we'll, we'll be getting you back, I think, for sure, uh, talk about things. So um, hi, everybody who's kind of listening in. And um, oh, hang on, I'm going to do that as well. I'm going to turn that off. That's it. Otherwise, I'll be listening to myself. Oh, that's it. Uh, right. So uh, we've got the amazing Alyssa Lott today from Lots Dogs. Now, uh, you very kindly said I can call you Lisa. Yeah, that's easier. Oh, that's <laughs> and you were saying that, um, that over there, your name's Lot. Yes. In the Netherlands, people call me Lot because, yeah, I'm called Lisa Lot. And in short, they call me Lot. So that's where Lots Dogs comes from a little bit. Yeah. The name. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but I can call you Lisa today. So thank you. Yes, for that. please so, do. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Lisa. Uh, and uh, I've been a great fan of yours for quite a while um, because your Lots Dogs page is awesome. It's it's the combination of great <laughs> advice, uh, a real emphasis on on the emotional experience. We're going to talk about that today. But great oh. graphics and really good kind of ways of framing important points. Uh, so I'm hoping that people who are listening in today will have um will be all to be aware of lots dogs but um if you haven't then afterwards go and check it out uh, right then, tell us a bit about yourself then tell us a little bit about what you do and uh then your journey into doing what you do yeah so what i currently do is i work full-time for my own business do-it-yourself business and um i work as a dog welfare and behavior consultant and I visit families who run into problems and I try to improve, you know, give advice that hopefully improves their quality of life. And um, I also am very busy uh, developing educational content for academies, um, for academies, dog academies, cat academies, but also for rabbits, people who want to learn about the behavior and welfare of companion animals, basically. And I work together with a team of experts writing new educational content, science-based, very important for me. Um, so I'm very busy with that. And uh, also, yeah, I have to remain in the field. So I'm also working in the field as the behavior or welfare and behavior consultant. And as for my journey, um, I was born in Scotland, actually. I can speak Scottish, but I won't. <laughs> Uh, and I moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, my parents moved a lot. My parents are both Dutch, by the way. Uh, but I lived in the UK off and on for around 10 years, uh, the first 10 years of my life. So, uh, And I also lived in Damascus, Syria, for a short while, and in Malaysia, on Borneo. Uh, I was about eight years old then, and I was always obsessed with dogs. So I bonded with street dogs there, which was really amazing. Uh, but yeah, moved around a lot. Uh, so we weren't able to have a dog for a long time until I turned 10. Then we got our first family dog, me very happy. Uh, but apart from being obsessed with dogs and fascinated with the relationship between dogs and humans, I was also into drawing and painting and music. I love music. And I started to write songs when I was uh, a teenager. So I wrote my first song when I was 13, playing piano. And that's how I ended up fast forward, with a bachelor degree in songwriting and music business. And I ended up working in the music industry for years and around 16 years. And I think it was about 10 years ago because I never forgot about my passion for dogs. And I actually really wanted to work with dogs. Um, so about 10 years ago, I quit my full time job at a record company and I started to work part time at a music venue so that I could invest all my spare time into learning about dogs. And at that time, I was already living in the Netherlands and the education that I could find there all had the emphasis on behaviorism. So behavior modification, changing behavior, behavioral results, everything was behavior, behavior. And something felt a 
bit off. Uh, there were also a lot of courses that were still having teachers that were talking about dominance theory and stuff like that. I never felt like that was my thing. And I ended up talking with a veterinary behaviorist in the Netherlands who was from Ireland. And she was on the lookout for me and she sent me this postgraduate course. And she said, look at this. I think this is something for you. It was an international course, um, a lot of online learning from international experts, a lot of veterinary behaviorists. It was science based and a lot of practical experience in shelters. So working with shelter dogs. And I learned about the behavior and welfare of dogs, cats, and horses. And it kind of opened a world for me because the first module I took, I, I remember I had to read this book. Um, it was called An Introduction to Behavior, uh, to Brain and Behavior. I think I have it here. This, this book and I had to read it from beginning to end and I was like um, what am I doing this is a human brain right so um, I was a little bit confused and I started reading and it opened up a world because I was like oh my god I never thought about this I never thought about dogs having a brain a nervous system how that's pretty complex how there's so much going on in the body, inside the body. And I learned about neurotransmitters and I became fascinated with the brain and not only with dog behavior, but also with human behavior and especially with emotions. And from then on, I just started reading and learning and, you know, doing more courses, visiting more seminars, listening to people talking. And of course, um, when I ended up getting the degree, the postgraduate degree in, uh, in companion animal behavior and welfare, I started to work in the field and visit families. And yeah, that's basically my journey in a nutshell. Um, but yeah, especially the part about emotions and about you know, how, how complex mammals can be, uh, that really got me interested and the welfare part. Because I noticed that a lot of education that is uh, about dogs is so about behavior, but why are we not learning about what the needs are of dogs and where dogs come from and um, what they need to function, you know, in, in the environment that they're in, how they, how they survive and how they've adapted to, to living with us because we're keeping them captive basically. Um, so, yeah, that, that really got me fascinated to see how can we make sure that we provide the dog in its needs, but not only the dog, also the human, because we yeah. have needs too. <laughs> Definitely going to come on to the human bit, because I know there's loads there for you to talk about. <clears throat> and I think it's very interesting. So when we first spoke, uh, I said, um, you've got a human psychology background, right? And you're like, no, I, my background's in music. And, it, and it's because yeah. now that all makes a lot more sense, because of course, when I've read your work, I think this 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 lady knows about the kind of psychology of behavior, the, the essence of behavior as an expression of self, you know, about how important behavior is for that way to express, you know, and that yeah. comes obviously from from your studies there. And I think it's also uh, cool that you call yourself a dog welfare and behavioral consultant. You put the welfare right at the beginning. The welfare first, yeah. Welfare first, yeah. And that's very much a, um, a very good reflection, isn't it, of the emotional experience about recognizing the Absolutely. entirety, the holistic element of everything. Yeah. What I think there's, it, yeah. there's far too little um, emphasis on welfare, in my opinion. Uh, I think we should really talk about that more. <laughs> or even an understanding of welfare, I think. Yeah, because, um, because when is an animal suffering, you know, because a lot of people are, are talking about, yeah, I put welfare first and it's very important to me. Um, but what is welfare? And, and when is an animal suffering? And when is it OK to have a little bit of stress, in example? And what I found in a welfare based approach is that you really need to have an individual approach. So what is good welfare for one dog um, may not be good welfare for another dog. You know, if you're talking about circumstances or, or methods or uh, whatever, everybody, each animal has its own individual welfare needs. So yeah, I'm not very fond of, of preaching methods or doing bold statements like you can't do this or you can't use that. I really wanna look at the individuals 
And that is what welfare is about, because welfare is different for everybody. And welfare is very much in the eye of the beholder, right? I think exactly, and, yeah. And, and I think it's also important to recognize how often our own value system can really dictate what we perceive as being welfare for another. Yeah, yeah. And the biggest, actually, the biggest threat to welfare is lack of education. I mean, research has shown that, um, you know, most people want to do the best, most people have good intentions but they just don't know. Uh, I mean, they've, they've, never, they've never known how to read their dog. They, they have no idea that their dog may be suffering or um, and, and even each other, right? We even have it with humans um, that we need to learn about the species that we interact with. Learn, learn, learn. And then you, yeah, a whole world opens and that is what will change your behavior in the end or your approach to, to people and to dogs. And it's interesting, when we had our chat, <clears throat> our private chat before, and we, we, the word welfare kept coming up in our conversation, it made me realise how little I use that word myself when I'm, when I'm, I, we all have our own vocabulary, I know. <clears throat> but when we think about um, truly being available to the needs of another, uh, that is about awareness, ultimately. And yes. true welfare comes from awareness. It comes from uh, being aware of the emotional need of another and bypassing our own projection of what we think via our narrative that that should be. And that's yeah. quite hard. And especially that relates very much with dogs and caregivers owners, of course, because they're not, you know, we, we, like you say, I think it's, it's important to recognize very few people are deliberately cruel or abusive. Yes, the majority even, even, aware. even, yeah, even the, the, the TV trainers, uh, most of them are just trying to provide themselves in their own welfare needs. That's how I look at it. And um, you can analyze human behavior. You know, actually, everything that I use or um, the way that I approach dogs is actually the same. I, I do the same with humans. Uh, but with humans, we have language, which is amazing, uh, strong, and, you know, has a really big influence on how people experience emotions, uh, what they feel, um, and how the conversation goes, right? Because the words that you use in conversations with clients, um, I have to sometimes choose them carefully. I, al I always look at, you know, I start talking and then I can start to feel, I, I try with empathy to feel like, okay, wh what type of person is this? I want to know about this person. What do they do for a living? Um, you know, maybe it's a young family with young kids and they, they're really stressed out. Um, I always try to, you know, empathize with that and see, okay, your needs are different from somebody who is, you know, totally relaxed, living alone, and um, doesn't have a care in the world. I don't know if that is necessarily when you're living alone, by the way, but uh, just an example. Um, so, so language is a very important thing and, and a very beautiful thing when you're working with humans, but you need to think about what language you're choosing and what words can do with, with people. I think this is a big part that's missing. And with yourself, uh, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think this is something that's missing as a profession or you know, as part of the industry, the community, is we need more education about <clears throat> the role of language and how we look at connecting to other people. Because, as you say, language is very powerful. And what we say, there has to be an element of relatability from the other. Because if not, exactly. we just either end up, the, the kind of, saying goes in one ear out the other they're not really listening yeah or we can end up creating more barriers with working because they now become defensive yeah so because I, I don't only look at you know it's not only the talking but I also look at the body language and you know it's 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 quite often that I see people you know also when I'm giving lecture lectures I give lectures too in the in the Netherlands and um I always look at the body language of the audience and you know so often I see them starting out like this you know, sitting backwards and, and being like this. And uh, I always love it. I see it as a sport to kind of get that opened up. You know, it may be cold. You may be sitting like this because you have muscles pain or whatever, but it's also very closed. Uh, and, and I look at that and I try to open up people. Um, yeah, so they can learn more and, and uh, yeah, be open for new information, other insights, you know, stuff like that. So let's just really focus in on that then, because this is great, because um, uh, 
trying to connect the a caregiver, the owner, to the emotional needs of their dog often means trying to navigate the caregiver's um, judgment, expectations, their belief system about what's going on, okay? Yes. Something you've mentioned to me, and I just want to look at this, so especially for um, professionals listening who are starting to think about having more of a emotionally centered approach, because this is what, one of the big things we've got to learn to overcome because uh, turning up with a more of an opera and talk is in its in a way a bit easier because we can get them to buy into a task orientated approach if yeah. we want more of a care orientated approach we've got to really get them to see where those care needs are so you're really amazing we we're sharing some examples last time uh, not allowing your own judgments to kind of overshadow what's going on when you're with that client. So give us an idea then about how you go in and approach a consultation and what your own little kind of coping strategies are there where you're, yeah. you're allowing yourself to be available to what the other person's saying. How do, you, how do you go about that? What have you learned over the years of doing it? So one of, one of the things that I use a lot is my cartoons, so my, my drawings, um, because I've noticed that you know, I, I'm myself, I'm a very visual learner. So I like to see how things are done. Uh, so that's that's why I like to draw. Um, and I, I have an example here, something that I often show uh, clients. Um, I just put this on the table and there's a, a brain here and there's a dog and a human and there's this stress and coping. And I just start talking like, you know, um, telling people that in the past, most people, we've always been focusing on behavior and only looking at, you know, what are we seeing? What is the visible behavior and how can we change behavior? And then I point at this picture and I say, you know, learning, learning theory is important because, you know, the, the dog will learn things and that will influence the process in the brain. But what I'm interested in and what I've been taught to look at and to think about is the brain. What's going on inside the brain? of the dog. And I've always noticed that people at the beginning are like, well, brain, well, this is too complicated for me. Um, but then I start to use analogies. So in example, if somebody raises their voice to a dog because a dog is doing something that they won't, you know, that frustrates them, they can become angry and they may raise their voice. That's actually an emotional response. And I can compare that to a dog who's frustrated, something is not going the way the dog had expected, and the dog starts to bark. Um, and those are the moments, you know, those analogies, analogies that people can relate to, they are really helpful, they open up. And then even the, the male, uh, the men are, you know, I don't want to be sexist, by the way, but a lot of time the men are sitting like this. Uh, even they are like, oh yeah, you're right. I'm actually, you know, you, you told me this story once, this brilliant story about somebody who was saying, I, I wasn't punishing my dog, I was being angry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same thing. I, I use that a lot. Uh, it, it's, it's not good or bad. And I tell them it's perfectly normal to react that way because we are mammals too. And we respond from our emotions. And if we're not taught we we don't know how animals work we don't know how processes work then it's very normal to just rely on your emotions and it's very normal to then get angry uh, raise your voice and if your dog then stops with what he's doing um, that's working for you so that's functional for you and i can use that as an analogy for you know whatever the dog is doing uh, and say like what, what the dog is doing right now which is causing you distress, may be very functional for the dog. So the dog may not even be suffering. You know, sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. They're not suffering at all. They're just doing behavior, which is really functional for them, which is a perfect coping strategy for them. And then I tell people, and that's also a very part, important part of my work, I think, to lower expectations or to get them to have more realistic expectations about their dogs. Because I then tell people that, okay, so we have a dog who is showing behavior, which is very functional for the dog and which, you know, is very normal for the dog and is a perfect coping strategy for the dog. And we are standing next to the dog as a different species 
saying, you know, that what you're doing right now, which is working for you, um, mm. is stressing me out. And we are actually asking the dog to, you know, we're, we're trying to change the, the path in the brain, you know, we're, we're, we want to have different behavior outcomes. And um, as soon as I explain that there's a brain involved with, with, you know, complex neurological pathways and circuits and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's not that easy, you know, to change uh, behavior. It's not that easy to get a mammal, a complex mammal, to change its coping strategy, which is perfectly functional for it, because we find it stressful. Um, and, and that really helps many times um, people to realize that, you know, I may have the round glasses, but I'm not Harry Potter. I'm not a wizard. I'm, I'm not here to like do poof and your dog is uh, fixed because it's a broken product. It's not a robot. And even though, you know, that's why I also hate these before and after videos and, and the marketing that a lot of dog professionals do because that is making people believe that you can change everything and train everything and everything can be trained and that you can mold a dog into you know the behavior outputs that you prefer which is not realistic at all because you know if you look at how humans are we're so different each of us and if i you know imagine somebody who has to quit smoking or or uh you know, if I tell you, you never drink a beer again, what, what would that do with you? That's, a lot, that's the type of questions that we're, you know, the type of demands that we're asking of dogs. So that is a part of the conversation that I have with, with family members is, is getting them to understand how a mammal works, processes information, um, what may be going on in the brain um, that is causing the behavior that they find stressful. Um, Again, it may be stressful for the dog too. It differs per situation, of course. Um, and how can we have realistic expectations and see how we can lower the frustration levels? Because many times uh, when I look at human behavior and when, it's, when there are problems with dogs, many times there's frustration. Sometimes there's fear. Sometimes there's even pain. Um, but a lot of times there's frustration because the expectations that we have don't match the dog uh, or the behavior of the dog. So I need to find ways to, to lower the frustration. And um, it's not really about um, having people uh, treat their dogs in certain ways, but it's more about how can I lower your frustration? I think that's, that's the way to, to improvement. And actually I do the same with dogs. You know, I just, I try to find out what is emotionally driving, most likely driving this behavior. Um, is a dog reactive because he's frustrated? Is it because he's scared? Is he fearful? Uh, is he in pain? You know, we often miss that. Um, there can be so many reasons and they're individual reasons and they need individual approaches. And a method? Uh, no, I don't work with methods. I'm, I'm, I always say I work welfare-based, so on an I individual. Like that, I like that frame, well, welfare-based. I think it's a good, um, it's a good uh, descriptor, especially for, for this kind of approach. And what you've described really, really well there is the importance of, or, or the real benefits of connecting the caregiver, the owner and their dog through the emotional experience and starting with the caregiver first. And I think, yeah. When we think about um, all the things you were talking about a moment ago that a lot of caregivers go through, so they, they feel guilt, they feel shame, they feel embarrassment, mm. they feel frustration. Um, I use the term relief a lot because for me, the word relief is really important when we think about any kind of emotional elevation, there is an element yeah. of relief seeking. If we're not aware of those with the caregiver, we might be focusing in on giving the dog relief, but no relief for the caregiver because exactly. their emotional yeah. story is still left kind of hanging a little bit. And uh, I think that's a big risk, even more so with a more task orientated style training because yeah. uh, we're missing out on both the dog and the, and the human. I, I do think we need to be careful with, um, um, you know, stating things about how, 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 you know, how, how people are or what is the right way or the wrong way, because um, I, 
I really believe that there are also people out there or family members out there who do like the task oriented approach. Um, so it will differ per person. Um, I think it's important to realize that because some people um, are not interested in this picture uh, and, and then I won't show it. So, um, but I have, because I'm always so clear in how I work and I have these drawings and I have this website with a lot of articles. Uh, most people that ask me for help or advice are really interested in the emotional experience. Um, but, you know, not all people are. So, and, and, and it's open, you know, whatever uh, makes you feel better uh, and the dog feel better um, is fine with me. Uh, so I think we should, we should be careful uh, to, you know, you have the operant merry-go-round, but we don't want to step into another merry-go-round as well, you know, like we're... Very true. We have to be careful with that, but there are a lot of people who are interested and who really feel the need to talk about emotions and about how they're feeling. And I always ask people, how are you feeling? How is the behavior of the dog making you feel? And how are you feeling with um, what I'm saying here? Because I, I often stop, you know, I explain things and then I'm stop and I look at the body language and I'm like, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about me, you know? advising this and then we start talking and you know is it clear um do you want another approach do you feel all right i think that's very important you know what you're saying to really look at the caregivers and it really starts there yeah it does and you know a lot of this uh, <clears throat> when i was involved in human therapy with humans before i came to animals and and if any, anybody listening in who's involved with human therapy well, now how important it is um, quite often regarding the, the direct support network for people uh, and getting them to recognize the, the support needs of that person. Because again, we tend to, um, when we think about judgments and expectations, yeah. as soon as we feel those are not being met, we are kind of designed to look to control, coerce or change. And, and we can do that with love. That's the, because, because we genuinely believe I'm, I'm doing I'm doing this on your behalf because it's going to help you. Um, and and if it's not authentic for the other person, they're just doing something because somebody else has told them to do it. And it's yeah. the same with dogs. But, but what I found with caregivers who once they start to think more about the emotions and you mentioned men earlier. And I think as a man, I can talk about men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you're right, because. Humans aren't, we're not great at communicating emotional need at the best of times, but I think many men, especially many men of, of certain generations specifically, uh, even more, it's more difficult. And I think it's, again, part of the skill for us is to try and provide safe avenues for them to express something because we all have a need to express something. A lot of our yeah. own emotional health problems is the suppression of being able to communicate emotional need. But um, once people do start to in their own vocabulary and in their own way start to connect in a little bit through the emotional experience it's amazing the information we start to get back from them yes because they're like I'm, oh now you've said that i remember seeing this and i wonder yes. if that's the thing i've had amazing conversations where 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 the men just just you know opened up and were so happy and and you know, you know, you were talking about judgments. Um, I, I always, I do use a questionnaire before I visit families because I want to know about the medical history. I want to know a lot of stuff that will save me time. You know, they can write me that. And a lot of times when I read that, that, that puts a layer of judgment on you because you're already, you know, I, I know professionals who don't use questionnaires just for that reason, because it, you, you start to judge or you start to think already about what's going on. And usually when you enter the home, it's totally different. Um, and what I found is very important in um, how you can open up people is ask them open questions and listen and, and um, confirm what they're saying. Like if, if, if they're like, yeah, I want to, I want to approach it this and that way, then first say, okay, I can understand. I can understand why that is important to you. And then, you know, you need to start with them first and, you know, give them like an, a, a reason or how can you say that? Allow them to be themselves and allow them to express themselves and respond understanding and try to understand them and listen to them before you try to change their behavior or change their views or you know uh, whatever it is that you want to do but listen first 
and show that you can empathize you know with them show that you understand them and that opens them up usually and this is really important because <clears throat> anything we ask or that we say during that consultation we have to recognize it is an invitation to we're inviting them to see things in a certain way or to do whatever and i think when we think about those situations or those cases where it's a bit of an uphill battle or we feel like we're swimming upstream that's often because whilst the client might have adopted the plans or gone along it, they haven't fully bought in themselves to what is actually happening. And I think that can often be a big block there because that comes back to this thing about managing those expectations. Because the biggest, the biggest antidote to expectations is gratitude when you think about it. And it's inviting clients to look at other areas where they can, uh, you know, instead of having that hour's walk on the beach to have that half an hour walk in the quiet woods to be thankful for that and to see how that's good for their own emotional well-being. I think yeah. that's really important. Right? Yeah, I think it's a really one of the questions that I always ask is what do you love about your dog and what do you like about your dog? And then they, they, you know, they start to bloom <laughs> usually. <laughs> they, 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 they get really, you know, they, they love their dogs and, and that, that really helps also in, in mellowing out the, the conversation. Um, and yeah, I, th I think it's very important to just listen to other people and to, you know, think about what you're, you're asking of people in the same way as, you know, thinking about what people are asking of their dogs. Like a lot of times we are asking people to, you know, if, if you're telling a person you can't raise your voice to your dog, you can't punish your dog. Uh, we need to understand that in many cases you're asking a human being to suppress their emotions, to not express themselves emotionally. Because that's what the caregivers are doing most of the time. They're just expressing their emotions when they're getting angry with their dog. And I think that's so important to realize that, that you're asking people to suppress their own emotions. Um, and I don't think that's, that's the right approach. I think you need to, uh, you know, what I was saying before, you need to consider, okay, where are these emotions coming from and how can I prevent them from building up? And a lot of it, a lot of it is also, um, can also be helped through providing people with information because having information um, calms you down. And that is also, you know, something we talked about before that a lot of people who have dogs, live with dogs or work with dogs um, have a big need. Well, actually all people, all humans, all animals have a need for control. Having a sense of control over your own experiences is a welfare need. And how can you feel more control? Well, you can coerce, you can, you know, start to be aggressive to another animal, but it, you can also get control through information and learning. Um, if you know what's happening when you feel an emotional outburst, you know what's going on inside your body, that can calm you down. You know, an example, if you know you're having a panic attack, and you know that a breathing exercise can calm, calm you down, that'll give you control, that'll help you to regulate your own emotions. And you can only, yeah, get that through information, you have to learn. Um, and, and that is something that we can give the caregivers, right? We can give them information about their dog, but also information about themselves. And a lot of times when you get all that information and understanding the expectations are more you know become more realistic but also the people become more calm and you can teach people to read their dog read body language of their dog and they're starting to see things and that information actually calms them down and that really helps in in the you know the the, the self regulation of of emotions that is so much more interesting than telling people that they can't punish their dog, right? And I think I think it is, and I think um, uh, I call them emotional airlocks. So it's like it's creating or giving information so that when some of this elevation is likely to happen, that we can think, okay, how can we create a bit of an airlock here so that it doesn't have to be us 
projecting our frustration or anger back onto the dog. But also I think what we've got to recognize is if we do, if we say to somebody, um, so like for example, in uh, a lot of my rescue colleagues say to me that within the environment they work in, they're often said, look, you know, you shouldn't get attached to these animals. You shouldn't get emotionally involved because we're trying to be professional and you've got to be detached. The problem is they will do all those things but now they feel they can't talk about it because they've been told yeah. you can't. And I think it's the same with clients. If we're saying all the don'ts and you shouldn't do's, the reality is they probably will at times because we can all be at the mercy of our own nervous system, but yeah. we're not gonna have that feedback or information back now. So we think, okay, well, you're, everything's been going on according to our plan, but we've lost that opportunity for an open and candid relationship. And I think, on our side of the, the industry where we, and, and I get it because many of us have campaigned for a long time to try and do things in a more kinder, humane way. And yeah. it's very important to us. And it's very much part of the, the essence for many of our colleagues. And it's very much their kind of raison d'etre really is to, <laughs> to be that. And I think we have to find ways for us to check that in the door. Because whilst on a bigger picture campaigning side of things, it's really important to be there with your placard and, and say- Yeah, I mean, stuff. I can do car cartoons that are very emotional and that'll, you know, get people yeah. to, to, to become angry or frustrated. I, I, I'll do that sometimes. <laughs> um, but I'm also aware that that is not going to help. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what I was gonna make. I think we've got to, when we're with our clients, we have to understand why they might have used that tool or they yeah. might have done that thing and where does it come from their, where does it they come have from? a reason they have a reason for doing so and the, you know just just like you want to analyze dog behavior you need to think about the human behavior in the same yeah the same way actually because we're all complex mammals and there are so many similarities we should use those and um i've also found that you know, in the dog world, because I, I've never really found that I, I'm part of the dog world because, you know, I really came from the music industry and I've, you know, just stepped in for the last six years or so. Um, but I see, you know, these really heated debates and discussions, usually all about how you should not punish your dog or how you should punish your dog. Um, or how you should only use positive reinforcement. It's very much in the in the operant merry-go-round that you you talk about a lot. Um, it's it's it's. I don't think it's helpful. And um, I also have that uh, in regards to marketing. A lot of dog professionals do. Um, my background is marketing as well. Uh, so a lot of professionals I see, they do these before and after videos, or they have these courses that are called perfect recall, or uh, do you want to walk relaxed with your reactive dog? Uh, finally get relaxed again. Look at this loose lead walking. It, it is all um, creating expectations, you know, from the people who are not professionals. They are seeing these video ads they are seeing these posts and they are thinking and believing totally understandably that everything can be trained. And yeah, I'm really, I, I, I really hope that there's going to be a shift in, you know, emphasizing behavior change and, and getting results, very result-based to welfare-based because when you look at welfare, it's not always necessary to train. It's not always necessary to, um, to get this behavioral result. It's not. Um, and, and that again uh, is depending on who is suffering and, and how can I you know, give relief. Um, that is so much more important than, uh, than changing behavior. And you can find creative ways. <clears throat> um, for, for families, you know, especially, you know, when I have these young families with young children, I can't ask them to train with their dog every day and do a whole protocol of, of training. Um, and I need to be more creative. I need to think about the stress levels of these family members. And that's usually also when I, when I get this cartoon out with, with the welfare needs of dogs. And I tell people, okay, so dogs have welfare needs, emotionally, behaviorally, physically how can we provide your dog in those needs let's look at that let's look at how your daily life is what can you do with your dog um, how can we provide the dog in its needs and 
prevents you from, you know, going into stress. Um, and that's also what, what you mentioned, like convincing people that they can walk uh, in an area where there's um, lease restriction or you have to leash, leash your dog uh, instead of going to a dog park filled with 20 uh, dogs that are all on the loose. Um, it's not necessary for welfare of dogs to go there. And again, based on the individual, because some dogs will thrive and other dogs will suffer. Look at the dog and look at the family and how can you make ends meet uh, welfare based and yeah a lot of times the behavioral result is you know it can be part of it but it's not a must i think results and the criteria behind results which again comes a lot with a uh when we have more of an operant approach because we're thinking right this is what we have decided is going to be the behavioral output yeah yeah um i think uh we can often forget the dog and the human both actually uh that and i, I call it alignment it's trying to find that middle ground between yeah. the welfare needs of Beautiful. one and the other yeah and actually a lot of the time i find with clients when we when we've talked through things and then we're talking about, well, maybe we need to do this or maybe we need that. It's actually a bit of a relief to them. They almost yeah. needed permission to not have to do those three walks a day because they're trying to be a good dog. Oh right yeah. Now. I have uh, that often. Yeah. The, the people are like, are you serious? I don't have to, I don't have to take my dog out three times for an hour. Oh, I thought I had to. And, and, and that's, you know, where, where this really comes in and, and, I also want people to look at, you know, who is your dog? And that's why I love the book of, of Kim Brophy, who you also yeah. talked to. I love her book because, you know, finally somebody is talking about where dogs come from. If I look at my own dog, she's, she's from Greece and I adopted her when she was 12 weeks old. And if I look at how she moves, how she walks in the streets, it really makes me think of those street dogs that I bonded with in, in Malaysia. And those street dogs, they were so interesting to me because they, they actually, they have this territory that is very important to them. They have this corner of the street. That's where they live. They know where they can get their food. They know where they're safe and they're a little family and they don't go out for walks in different, in, in unknown territories, meeting loads of unknown dogs. That is very stressful to them. So in understanding my own dog, who, you know, I think she's most likely a mix of all kinds of types of breeds, terrier, um, you know, dachshund, st stuff like that's in her. She's a hunting dog. But there's also a street dog in her. And she is not, she, I will not um, fulfill her needs if I expose her to a lot of different things. If she, she sees things that she doesn't know, objects, people, dogs, her stress levels rise and she becomes really alert. She starts scanning the environment. She, she becomes stressed. She actually prefers to just go outside and walk in the street and check who's peed where, when, leave her own marks. And that's it. That's, that's fine. Maybe hunt some mice. And she's absolutely happy. And um, that is my dog. But we have all these different types of dogs. And these different types of breeds of dogs. And we've, you know, the, 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 the scary thing is, is that we humans have actually changed the wiring of the brain of, of dogs. You know, if, if I look at how, how some, you know, Belgian Malinois, an example, they're so different and they have different welfare needs to uh, a golden retriever. Yeah. And you really need to look at that. And many times people ha are not aware of this. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely uh, advise people to read Kim Brophy's book. <laughs> oh, it's a great book. And I think this comes back to awareness again. And I think a lot of, um, I talk a lot about the psychology of judgments and expectations because that really does underpin a big part of the challenge we have because we've been kind of um, brainwashed really into what it is to be a dog owner, what our responsibilities yeah. are, what we're yeah. expecting our dogs to have. And, when you actually step back and when you guide clients through this process and they realize there is a direct correlation between their dog's stress levels and their own because of yeah. course it's symbolic uh, and uh, and even when you start thinking about when you say to them so when you're at home you know you're obviously you're caring with your dog and loving and you're having the relationship but for some of the cl some clients 
their nervous system starting to engage even an hour, two hours ahead of the dog walk because they're already thinking, yeah, oh my yeah. God. But again, once we've invited them to maybe not have these elements in their life or maybe not every day, oh, yeah. Yeah. they can kind of, but also, um, uh, we have, uh, because of the way that our brains are, are kind of worked, we create these connections that, yeah, but I need to take my dog out because it fulfills this for me, it fulfills that for me. So we're talking very much about their needs. And another role for us, I think, is to think, okay, you want to go down that cafe with your dog, but your dog can't even do that at the moment. Where can we find other outlets for your needs? Because they've been convinced that without the dog, they somehow can't do it. And it's a yeah. little bit, it reminds me of some of the conversations I've had with people with with substance abuse in the past they they, mm. they may they feel they can't go out unless they have a drink or they can't do that unless they have a cigarette but and, what can they do look at look at yeah 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 look at, look at creative a ways. With, yeah and it's different similar process with people how they perceive their relationship with their dogs they somehow yeah. need their dog to do something i actually once had a client who um desperately wanted to go to the dog park because mm. that was that provided her in her social need so, and I really had to talk to her about that. And I ended up advising her to still go to the dog park, but without her dog and just meet up with her friends and talk and have a great walk and enjoy without having the stress of, of your dog being stressed. And I actually told her to do that. Go out on walks, go to the dog park if you enjoy it. If it's for your welfare needs, please do so. Um, but always try to consider the dog's welfare needs as well. And maybe, you know, it depends on, uh, I always ask, can, can your dog be alone? Is, is your dog okay with being alone? Then go to the cafe without your dog. Why do you need to bring your dog, <laughs> you know? I think there's a lot there because remember, you know, we, we are limited within our scope. So we're not there to provide therapy for the humans as such, although there is a part of that, but there will be unmet needs in other areas. And, and quite often, actually, you only have to look at the social dynamic of the family to kind of pinpoint where some of those needs might be coming from, actually. But, but also, uh, what's a useful little exercise that I've done with some clients is when we start to talk about the emotional experience, the role of body language and things to look out for, taking the owner out without the dog to see other people and their dogs yeah. can be really enlightening for them because they're like, oh, wow, we've walked out, we've been out for half an hour now and I've seen loads of dogs barking at other dogs. So I've seen that is loads really of dogs looking really uncomfortable and that kind of thing. And they can see it more when we're giving a little bit of a narrative, pointing stuff out to them. Then That's we can a go- great oh, idea. It That's... works well because we, yeah. some people, they need to see something different. Yeah. Because if you're just pointing stuff out with their own dog, it, it's, it, they're too Yeah, and, the, and they will be a little bit stressed as well because their own dog yeah. is there and they're, they're afraid that it may go wrong. And that's actually a, a great idea. I'm going to steal that from you. You can, anybody can. Well, I think the thing, especially if you've got a dog who doesn't necessarily have meltdowns, but has quite a few moments on the walk and struggles a little bit with social processing and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. The embarrassment you feel, the shame, all the kind of things you feel, you kind of feel like you, you're the only one with a damaged dog, right? As we yeah, see. yeah, and you're not. When, you, when you're going out looking uh, <laughs> and just seeing, guess what, you'll see a lot. In fact, you'll yeah. see a lot. You almost kind of, it's, it's, the, it's the adage of having a child who's a little bit challenging and then just being reminded at the playground that maybe your child isn't the most, challenging child there sometimes yeah all these things can help I think in, in the mix we said I think it was also interesting we said uh, the reason I keep looking down here but the puppy's woken up I've got a puppy oh, okay okay so, up and I've given ten, her 10 minutes puppy 10 minutes Molly and I said, yeah we're doing good I keep giving her things off my desk just random oh. things to chew on now. uh she's doing all right she's doing all right okay. uh the I think it is important uh what you were talking about earlier regarding how we market certain things how we title books how we put out posts and, yes and I think uh, Rachel Meadows um uh, amazing Rachel Meadows who I know is a big fan of yours uh, uh by the way uh, she I think she's listening in as well um Hi. she said to me uh, several times how much as trainers how much we do for the attention of or the validation of other trainers and I think some of these posts we put out is just as and I get it it is about that kind of we need yeah. that validation to show you want to show to it. others Show yeah. to others that I can yeah. do it, and yeah. I, so I get that, and I and I don't think that will ever change. I think there is always going to be an element of that, as I say, from a marketing point of view. But I do think we have to, if we're going to be really ethically sound regarding our approach, I think we do have to think about what we title things. This kind of I think so too. to calm and all this kind of thing, yeah. because 
what is it kind of saying and what is it saying about that dog in the first place you know we need to start thinking more about um list you know titling more i'm just saying this off my head it's probably not a very good one but i think something like listening uh, learning to listen to your dog's care needs or whatever it is you know so it's more it's more realistic and more truthful i think yes um, and and you know some of the dogs that are reactive some not all but but some don't suffer some are just expressing their emotions recovering really fast and it's how they cope and you know i always find it fascinating how we humans are very uh we become stressed when others express emotions so it's not not only we also become stressed if if, if a human expresses emotions um and, you know, we've all, always been, you know, in our culture, it's always, you know, suppress your emotions or no, you're being too emotional. And emotions have kind of a negative yeah, vibe to it. And um, it really got me thinking, like, you know, is this is this dog suffering, you know, in regards to welfare? Is it suffering or, or can we just let it react for a couple of seconds and recover? Is that a bad thing? Why are we always um, wanting to stop? emotional expressions that's something to think about right i think it's really important and i think this is the bigger part of the bigger picture thing of course that as a society especially here in the west you know from the moment we're kind of born really we're expected to conform behaviorally we're expected to we're already told that some behaviors are good some behaviors are bad yeah it starts in you know oh starts, don't cry don't cry or don't, cry, don't, don't get angry uh but but um you know i think that um from a psychology uh, point of view, uh, a lot of people um, have problems later on in life because of that. Hugely. And, uh, so yeah, again, and, yeah. and I think that's something um, we could think about in regards to our expectations and demands of dogs. Why is it such a problem if a dog barks? I mean, I can understand if it's a, that it's a problem if he barks for hours or, or, or if the dog is suffering, then it's a problem. Um, but you know, a couple of short barks and recovering really quickly. Um, why is that such a bad thing? Uh, and and sometimes it can help to you know what you're saying, like like showing people like how many dogs bark, how many dogs do that, how many people get angry, how many people, you know, why can't we just yeah look at welfare instead of only at the behavior change? That's that's basically my 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 main thing see if a dog is suffering, see if a human is suffering and help them, help them to improve their quality of life. And um, behavior change is not always necessary. No, it's not. And of course, if you feel differently, you'll act differently. And I think that's something we have to really kind of recognize. And also, I think this is a bigger picture thing I know. Um, um, is we even have to think about what we're doing regarding our relationship with dogs from an early age with this projection of what we need them to do for us and yeah. how difficult it can be for many dogs, um, I wouldn't say all dogs, but many dogs, to even provide that for us, actually. And, and how a lot of the things that you and I might get called in for because there is now a perceived behavioral issue or challenge is actually the dog's response to not being able to express in other ways at, at other points in their life. I think there's a lot of here, but definitely when we think about why we have the belief system that we generally have, the zeitgeist that is still there regarding dogs and the expectations we put on it, and yeah. understanding that and how strong that is in our clients, how very yeah. strong. And I think that that does stem from from the need for control. You know, I think I think I think it does. Um, I think we as, as, as mammals, we really like to have to be in control and we like to be able to um, understand things and, and control things, uh, ourselves, others and other animals. And um, so that will probably always remain, I think. But yeah, I, th I think through education and through giving people more information and, and I think that's our task as, as professionals to to open up the minds of other people and to start opening up people to really think about how is my dog feeling what is the quality of life for my dog and 
you know, sometimes I even discuss rehoming a dog because they can, they are flexible, they can recover from it. And, uh, you know, I've seen it with my own dog when I lived in the city. I, I lived in a busy city with her at first. She was suffering. She was really suffering. And, um, you know, I, I ended up living in a really, in a farmer's area now and, and she's blossomed and, and she feels so much better. So the environment, the living environment is also a really a huge factor. And, and quite often it's something that the dog in that current situation can't escape from. Yes, yes. You know, it's the one thing that they, they have to kind of keep um, working around. I think um, when we do connect people through the emotional experience, I think this is why, it's only my opinion, I know it's one that you share. Uh, I think it's the most effective way. We can't always do it, I know. but you're more likely to activate those care circuits for the client then in a more direct way, because even when they're suppressing the dog, telling the dog off, doing whatever, they still care for their dog. They still feel that, hang on, somehow that behavior is bad and I must get you to stop it because that's their narrative. Yeah. When they shift that and they connect more and start realizing that the dog is probably expressing some need through that behavior, those care circuits can really take over now. And, and yes. the majority of people they need the opportunity of that awareness that we talked about right at the beginning to yeah. open some of those opportunities for them to go, go into care mode now. Yeah, and that is what, what I do. That is, that, is, that is exactly what I try to do. Um, and that, that is what it's about, I think, in a welfare-based approach. And uh, I always say, you know, a very, very few people are psychopaths. <laughs> very few people are psychopaths. Most people really want the best for their dogs, care about their dogs. Um, and they believe that what they're doing is good. They believe that what they're doing is helping the dog and themselves. Even if, you know, I can see with my knowledge that the dog is suffering. Um, I need to be aware that the person um, needs to be educated and needs to be opened up to different views. But I need to listen to the person first. And I need to be, you know, I need to empathize with, with, with the other person. And um, yeah, I'm talking in a circle now, aren't I? No, but I think we've come around. Actually, so we're coming up to the end of the hour now. And, yeah, um, uh, we're going we're going around in circles now. <laughs> uh, but I think we've just we've we've come back round nicely about this notion yeah. of awareness and and the importance of uh, recognizing the human aspect, the human you know, what people go through. It's, it's very easy, uh, and we we always have to kind of be mindful of it because it is easy to overlook the caregiver and their emotional experience with what's going through yeah. and if we don't put some remedy there find relief for them a little bit then actually the the outcomes aren't going to necessarily be best because um, there will be resistance along the way um and just to add yes. don't forget yourself don't forget yourself. don't that's forget important. yourself that's important too do you know what that is so important because we also have to be aware of our own ourselves and yeah um, and, uh, and your own limitations you don't know everything i mean i mean i don't know everything i'm always learning uh, i've changed my views thousands of times um be aware of that and also be aware of your own welfare needs like as i say know. that's the that's the important thing there i think is to be aware of our own emotional experience we can uh you know with this is not and this is not a fault of the clients that I've had in the past who have I, I find I found more challenging. It's more about me and boundaries, probably. But there are some situations, some cases that just really take it out of you, and uh, you can find yourself disappearing down a very dark hole very quickly. And yeah. we have to be aware of that uh, and learn better about recognizing these kind of uh, aspects for ourselves. Yeah, um, I think it's important, uh, Lisa. So. Um, Tell us about uh, how people can find out. We've got lots of dogs, obviously, but tell us about um, other things, other ways that people can connect or find out about your work or, or access what you do. I do think that it's, it's, it's lots of dogs right now because um, especially when it's internationally, uh, for me, I'm trying to channel everything through lots of dogs. So I've got a YouTube channel, I've got Facebook, Instagram, uh, and a website, writing articles. Um, and um, for the Dutch people, I have a Dutch platform and I give lectures in the in Belgium and the Netherlands. 
haven't been able to do so because of COVID, obviously, but uh, hope to get back to that. Um, and I'm hoping that through Lots Dogs, maybe to open doors to to uh, to more uh, international, uh, you know, to the world. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. it's only yeah. lost dogs right now so i don't have any any i don't have a book or a course or stuff like that yet and i don't know if i will make courses because i yeah once you've made something recorded something a couple of months or a year later you're like oh i'm thinking differently right now and i love it that i have everything you know my own drawings my own website and i can change it all the time i'm always changing the articles when i learn new stuff um so uh, lots of dogs, check me there, I'd say. And um, what I want to start doing is creating um, a library list in the group uh, of, um, you know, both uh, members in the group, but also uh, kind of um, to inspire. Of speakers. Yeah. Yes. So uh, have a think about that and let me know and I'll add that into the list if that's OK. And, uh, do you mean books or do you mean people or pages yeah, or anything yeah. where you where you good resources, oh, yeah. the books you love to read, the kind of places you like to go. I, want to I actually have resources. all the you know, most of the books that I've read, I have that on my website. OK, and I've written I've written what I what I think about those books as well. So you can find them on my website um, because, yeah, reading. I love reading books. I read books every day. I read. Um, so I love it's that. amazing how a lot of our inspiration doesn't come from dog related books. That's that's interesting. That true, true. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the books which is amazing is this book. Actually, I can recommend it. It's Come about, mm. yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty hardcore, but, uh, but it's about emotions um, and it's, and it's about human psychology. And I, I love to read about it because a lot of that can be also, uh, you can use it on dogs as well. Um, but, you know, as said earlier, I'm working with humans mostly and, and communicating with humans. So I, I want to know everything about them <laughs> and about myself, of course. True. This is the thing about the emotional experience, right? Because neurologically and physiologically, we all share a lot. We share a lot with our dogs. Yes. What we also know about the emotional experiences that is unique to us, our own experience. Oh, yeah, they're unique. unique. Yeah. So yeah. why not learn about emotions from a human psychology point of view and then extrapolate what we need and make some reasonable, reasoned assumptions that the dog's probably going through having a similar neurological, biological, physiological response, but that it will be very different for them. But that because it's different doesn't mean we shouldn't want to try and learn more about it. I think yes. Oh, you're Molly's. <laughs> um, oh, well, one of the things yeah. I learned is the, the influence of, of language on emotions and on your emotional experience. Yeah. That actually, if you have multiple words for a feeling, um, that can make you more emotionally resilient. I read that, which is interesting. I think, you know, uh, are you angry or are you disappointed or are you just a little bit grumpy? Uh, all those types of words, they, they impact how you feel. And that's important when we think about go be going through a therapy process, of course, because the therapist yes. is there to help you kind of fine tune that. And for somebody to say, so I've heard what you said, so does it, you know, is it, are you feeling guilt? And just trying to, because when we start to, we, we can end up having a bit of an emotional soup sometimes and I, that can really get us down over time and yeah. starting to listen to things and and also listening to emotions ourselves um you know especially things that are emotionally painful there is a reason there there is something for us to connect to something for us to understand something for us to seek relief from and i think that's important and all this can be very helpful i know a lot of my clients when we go through this journey together with their dog it can be quite life changing for them because they're like, right, actually, I can see like that, that example you, you mentioned earlier, that, that gentleman I worked with who said to me, yeah. I realized now I wasn't punishing my dog. It was because I was angry. It's my yeah. anger. I've got to start thinking about how do I control that? Yeah, it's a great and story. It's important, and I think it's important. Well, darling, it's been amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. going to totally have you back. There's, I've written down a few things here that I think we could have a, a, a kind of unpack on. Please um, share stuff in the group. Uh, you've just got a free reign. Uh, you, know, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and definitely let us know anything that comes up in the future. And if you do anything, if you do do some webinars or any little courses down the line, please let us know. But uh, it's been it. today. And uh, I think it's going to be a really helpful for caregivers for sure because we've talked about a few things there but also other professionals because um one of the things i really want us to look at in this current series of chats is 
the practical applications of all this stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's important. Yeah. So it's important. So thank you for all that today, Vang. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I was honored to be invited. So thank you very uh, much. Yeah, thank you very much. For sure. And uh, thank you. And thank you, everybody. So we've got the amazing Shay Kelly next time. And yeah. Can't, can't, watch. Time. can't wait to speak to Shay. Loads for us to talk about. Uh, and uh, yeah, stay safe, everybody, and speak to you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>